My name is Larry Rao. I work at Verizon, specifically work in Verizon Labs. And Verizon Labs is the, well, we, we innovate. That's what they say. We, uh, we're actually the internal development um, group within Verizon. And the products we create um, are, are ultimately targeted at our different business units. So Verizon wire, Wireless, our Fios, our, our video services, those types of um, products. So it's, it's pretty widespread. Everything we do is at scale. So we always have to be concerned about that scale, the reliability. Um, I started down this whole path with containers with a, with a problem. So I, I had a team that uh, several years ago, we started looking at what we would need to do to, to um, look at how we handle the Internet of Things. When we look at this explosion of devices within people and, and what that's going to do for the amount of information coming into our systems. And, and so we looked at this problem and, and said, so, you know, we want to solve this. And, and I started working on architecture. And, and that led us down what everyone today calls microservices. And we definitely wanted to develop and architect our solutions as, as a set of microservices that we can deploy across our infrastructure, look at how we can take advantage of, um, of, of the infrastructure in a, in a coherent way. And so that, that led us, of course, then when we look at, well, how do you package up microservices, you know, that led us to containers. Um, and so we, we definitely knew we wanted to, to distribute our... Um, our services as a set of containers. We looked at, uh, we looked at doing this as, as virtual machines. That's too heavy weight. We, we like the, the isolation that Linux provides you. It was internally developed application, so we didn't need the multi-tenancy. So the containers gave you just the right amount, or what I like to call just the right amount of um, isolation. So it was, just, it was just right. And then we, we wanted to make containers as small as possible so they launch quick. And then we can move containers around the, the system. And of course, that led us in that we, we want to have lots of containers. And so clearly, we're going to have lots of different applications. Um, as it scales, we'll scale the containers. So we need an environment that allows us to launch and manage a lot of containers. And so then that leads you down a path of, you know, what do I do next? How do I do this? And so I looked at our existing infrastructure. And you look around and you look at how we deployed things. And, and it, it, it's sort of like this. It's a, it's a bunch of silos. And, Specifically, as this picture shows, it's a bunch of old silos. And we go, well, this isn't going to work. So, so we had a deployment challenge, too, we had to solve. So that, that sort of diverted me from now I have this team doing Internet of Things. And then I started looking at how, how do we deploy within our, within our platform, within our infrastructure, within our data centers. And we started rethinking that whole approach on what we want to do um, to manage this, this complexity. So, so clearly, we wanted to look at this as a as cluster computing problem. We want to have lots of commodity hardware. We want to spread it through the data center. We want to make efficient use of this hardware. We want to isolate our services from hardware faults. Um, it has a, a nice benefit. These microservices distributed across the system. I can absorb hardware faults. I can scale nicely. Everything's uniform. I want to take efficient use of, of all my resources. And then. Of course, so we have these clusters, and then we're really going to have many clusters. So Verizon has many data centers literally around the world. And so the ultimate goal is I can take and treat my data center as a big cluster, and then I can run multiple data centers and interlock those, those clusters so all my containers can reach each other all around the world. And so again, we, you know, these are the challenges that we face. So then we started looking at different technologies. And these are some of the, the primary technologies. I want to say the core technologies. It's kind of irony there that we, we wanted to look at. So, so clearly, you know, Linux, um, we're, we're, very, we're very fond of open source. We want, to, we want to use as much open source as possible for different reasons. We want to contribute where possible because it helps sort of keep the state of the art moving forward. Um, we landed on. Um, uh, Linux, of course, was, was sort of a given, and, and using containers within Linux was a given. So that was, that was a lot of the starting point. And my team actually looked around, and um, you know, we, we actually considered using or, or building our own Linux distribution effectively, just, you know, and some companies have done that, and say, because I didn't want to carry the burden of a you know, large amount of uh, you know, Linux utilities and applications and things that you don't need if all I wanted to do was run containers. And so we looked at, like, I, I just want to create a minimal Linux. And, uh, and, and that shouldn't be too terribly hard to do. Um, 
but we, we took a look around the, the sort of the landscape to see what was, what was available. And uh, we came across Core OS. And uh, that looked pretty cool. Yeah, it looked like they had the right idea. It looked exactly like what we wanted to, to do for the most part. Then they, they had this, this thing called etcd. And I go, well, that, that's pretty cool. That solves a problem. Um, Fleet, that solves a problem too. So all these things tended to fall in place where we say, look, this, the, these guys, you know, CoreOS seemed philosophically aligned where we wanted to go. So, so that was good. It was Linux-based. That was good. They, they stay true to the Linux um, core, so that was all good. And, uh, and we're, we, we started you know, trialing CoreOS. Core I don't even know when we started it, long before we probably talked to CoreOS. Uh, we started uh, running it on different systems. And we looked at a couple other alternatives as well and considered you know, being crazy and doing something ourselves. Um, but the CoreOS seemed to fit the bill there. And then we started looking for, we, we actually use Mesosphere. I know that's not, uh, you know, there's, a, there's another thing that is being talked about here. Um, Mesosphere you know, um, provides us our orchestration, our ability to launch containers across the cluster. And, uh, and, and that, that was a, a pretty good, um, you know, we're pretty happy with that choice as well. But the primary thing is we, we build our applications around, around containers. We actually use Docker images. Um, but, but I view the Docker, you know, I view the primary thing is getting our applications built around this concept of microservices and, and containers. And then there's a couple different ways that you can choose to launch those containers and manage those containers. And uh, you know, for us, it, it was Mesos, but um, that's all built on, on the underlying core OS. And we actually use Fleet to, to bring everything up. So every system component before we launch our, our Mesos layers is actually brought up with Fleet. And so in CoreOS, we, we actually uh, pixie boot CoreOS across our clusters. Um, back in, uh, I think it was July timeframe, we actually demoed um, at MesosCon, and we, we actually you know, showed a bunch of containers firing up in, in a small amount of time. And uh, that was actually done on a 500 node cluster that we exposed. Since then, we've, we've, uh, we've launched on a 1,000 node cluster, and um, second data center's coming up in 1,000, and next year we'll We'll have two more data centers added um, to the mix, and, and the, the growth rate is, is pretty high as we start um, adding more applications onto the cluster and as we, we start scaling. Um, the last one I'll mention here is we, we had to solve a problem of our, our persistent storage, and we partnered with EMC um, in, in this respect, and, and they provide us two core components that I think complement our entire cluster, and, and one is an object storage system. So uh, they, they call it ECS. Um, it exposes a S3 interface, so that's, that's really convenient for application developers. Um, and then a second product they have is, is called Scale.io, and that actually pro provides a virtual block storage system. So what that allows us to do now is I can, one, if my applications need block storage, I can present each container a, a a type of block storage, and then they can lay file systems and databases on top of it. But the key thing is that volume can travel around the cluster, so to speak, and follow that container around. So if I lose a piece of hardware, I can bring that container up on another, in another place within the cluster, and that volume, that virtual volume, can follow that, um, that container around. And it has other attributes. It allows, has a very, very high IOPS because you can distribute your, your reads and writes across a number of of systems, so that that gives us now the ability to bring our containers up in a virtualized, pretty much from all the hardware, and we run a very simple network. So we end up in a simplistic view. Yeah, you know, we end up with a, obviously our our consistent nodes underneath, and we we go with fairly, um, I'd say medium or high medium range hardware. So we keep a we keep a control on the amount of resources available. I shouldn't say medium for some of you guys. I mean, we, we run 128 you know, gigs of RAM and, and 48 cores or virtual cores. So they're not, they're not like low end, but, uh, but it's, it's pretty cool to bring up a, a thousand nodes times 48 virtual cores times 128 gigabytes of RAM and, and be able to launch applications on a cluster that big. Um, so that, that's, it's always fun just to see it. It's fun to actually you know, hit a container and tell it to replicate you know, a thousand times or whatever, and, and watch it all start coming up. So it's always, always fun to, I still get a kick out of doing it for whatever reason. Um, so our, our system is, is basically, we, we try to keep everything generic 
um, on the nodes underneath. It's a little more complex than this because of our network setup. We, we, have, we literally have seven different types of networks. I think it's seven, might be more that we talk to because of our production networks. And we actually have the system outlaid in a, in a front end and a, and a back end type system. So front end nodes actually have two physical NICs and they'll, they'll talk to an external network and, and that allows, makes our security team a little happier that we have a DMARC uh, between services. Um, but once you get inside, what I call inside the network is everything's a flat network we, by, by first quarter, second quarter next year, it will literally be all IPv6 addressing. We had two components that, that weren't IPv6 ready that, that um, caused us to change a little bit. But we still run a very flat hierarchical um, network. And so every, every rack, every, every data center gets a subrange, every rack gets a subrange, every node gets a subrange, and then every container gets its own IP address. And barring discovery, every container can, can literally talk to at least have network connectivity to every other container within the cluster and, with, and between clusters. And so the networking, and it's all fairly optimal. There's not a lot of, there's no natting, there's no, you know, pretty much your the packet comes off the, off the NIC through the kernel into the container. And so we, we get pretty, we're pretty happy with the network throughput. And then we do some, some network magic to, to do, um, uh, IP load balancing across, so when you come in from the internet, it'll load balance across the front end nodes at an IP level, and we have the ability to, to key off uh, different attributes, tuples of the connections. So we don't run, we don't run physical uh, uh, load balancers in front of any of our systems. Everything's, in a sense, distributed. We run our firewalls distributed across the nodes. Our load balancing is distributed. So everything's truly running you know, sort of in a cluster fashion. And we have our scheduler and resource manager, and of course you, you compose your applications as a set of, uh, of containers and they get dispatched onto the, onto the nodes. Yeah, I mentioned on here the, the, what I like about CoreOS is the cluster readiness, if you will. So CoreOS comes up as already being um, ready to, to run in this type of environment. And like I said earlier, we, we obviously use etcd. Uh, we, we actually expose etcd to application layer and then obviously the system components make use of etcd itself. And then we use Fleet to actually you know, orchestrate the, the system booting up. And uh, that's been a pretty good, pretty good system for us. I think the, you know, when we headed down this, this path, you know, what all this technology in a sense enables is that I have this, this very flexible platform, very scalable platform. I can, I can organize my data centers, I can resource it, I can, I can purchase equipment on a quarterly basis based on our growth output of all the sum of our applications. So we, we have a nice way to manage the core infrastructure. I think it was talked about earlier, the, the separation of the managing the physical, managing the platform, and then managing the applications. And it allows your applications teams to, to really focus on managing their solution, if you will, and don't, don't get into, to again, back to my, my silos picture, it used to be when you deployed an application, it would, you would start with, well, how many machines do I need to buy? And then I would, I would start with, um, well, we need a three-year outlook, because and it's Verizon, we need, to be, we need to be highly reliable, so it needs to be redundant in the data center, it needs to be geographically distributed, so I have to bring up two sites, and so I have to multiply all my equipment by two, and I have to buy enough to replicate everything in the data center, and, and then I have to look at a three-year out, outlook for, and of course, every application, presents their hockey stick that shows their number of users are going to shoot up in you know, year six, you know, in six months, and then it's going to go astronomical in three years. So you have to purchase all this hardware up front. And, it takes, and then it takes a while to deploy, because you've got to go from day zero to, well, I've got to get that hardware deployed in it. And it takes a while. I've got to go reserve power and, and space in a data center somewhere and line up behind everybody else. I've got to get IP addresses all assigned. There's, there's a lot of work that would go into place to, to, to set up one of those silos again. And then my silos are all firewalled off from each other because you can't trust your neighbor because he's evil. You know, he sits in the cube next to you, but he's still evil. He's trying to break into your app. So we surround everything with firewalls and load balancers and it just, it gets crazy. And so, so just to deploy your application, you're looking at this long time frame. you're looking at this huge capital expense and you go, that, that's crazy. What I really want is my apps teams to go, I have an idea, I want to get it in the market, and I want to do it now, and I can build it now, and I want to push a couple buttons and deploy it. 
And, and that's where we're headed. And this gets into this whole workflow needs to be streamlined. And I need my apps teams to not worry about purchasing hardware. All they need to do is, is give me a little bit of a heads up on you know, what, what your forecast is going to be. And we have planning sessions. We do this in, today in our networks. We, every year there's a planning session. It goes into how do I build my capacity for the, for the you know, next set of years? What's, what's our growth rate looking at? So we're going to do the same things with our, with our data centers, with our applications, with this sort of compute and storage. Let's, let's plan it. And I can look at the aggregate of all the applications, both the new ones coming in and how they're going to grow, and the ones that are existing, your legacy ones that are evening out. And we can look at the what's your spike going to be? You know, what, what time of year? You know, is it Christmas time? Is it, do, you, do all your apps spike? So we can look at all these things and plan the entire data center in a much more cohesive manner, much more economical for us, much easier for the development teams. And then it allows us to get this whole automation going into place and allows our developer teams to go literally not just from the idea and deployment, that can go fast, but every time you want to iterate, you don't want to go through the same process. I almost put a slide up here with a mop because if you guys aren't in the telecom industry, there's a thing called mops, method of procedure. And it's, it's, it's basically, it's, it's, you might as well um, you know, take a knife and cut yourself and put salt on it. It's, it's kind of, it, it feels like that when you go through it with our ops teams. Traditionally, you know, who makes the mop? And it's, a, it's crazy. So we, we, we used to joke when we started this whole platform, eliminate mops. Now, that's not to say that the reason for these things are you need, you need to be deterministic on how you deploy, but, but the process needs to be a lot more lightweight. So we still do the builds. We still do the tests. We still choose when to deploy. But we can push, we can pull all this tighter together. And that's what this really allows. So all the technology comes into you know, allowing us to be more efficient and allowing us to deploy better applications in a much quicker way. And this is what the benefits are that, that, that we see anyway, that you know, obviously the efficient use of resources is, is key on all levels, just you know, from a business perspective, obviously, but I think also from a development perspective. Um, the speed and elasticity, so, so, so that's good. The, the ability to take your application and, and you know, right now you can, you can push a button and scale it, but what the platform allows and what we're working on is like now I want to get to, to truly full automation. How do I scale it on demand? What triggers the scaling event? And so we, we have some of that, and in, in your applications have to be ready for this. Um, there's lots of things that have to be ready, but the apps teams need to, to sort of wrap their heads around this, this form of computing as well. And so you, know, you get a, a, away from this thing of, of just sort of thinking in fixed resources. Um, you build your applications to be highly distributed. There, there will be failures. They will die. They, um, but that allows them to equally expand and contract on demand. And that allows us, that, that goes back into your, your efficient use of your resources. So different applications are going to go through different resource usages over time. And we find that the whole platform, and you guys probably all know this. You know, I saw everyone raise their hand on who's using containers and all this. They're, if you build them right, too, if they're extremely lightweight, ours are, are pretty small containers, you know, almost one application per, per container. They launch quick. And, and that's great. So if, if something dies, it launches fairly quick. So, you know, some other component comes up. If you built your application to be truly a, a distributed type application, um, it just works. And it, and it's, it makes everything easier. Um, so that all ties together. And then finally, we, we isolate software from hardware. That's just a, um, that's a nice thing. I, it, we, if you guys have built in, in sort of tier one data centers too, and, and, and again, back to the old silos, um, every, every time you built hardware too, you had to, you had to have strict SLAs for, um, for all those hardware vendors. And, and for Verizon and, and anybody who has uh, data centers around different parts of the country, and you require your hardware vendor to have a four hour time window to replace a piece of hardware, that, that hardware failure becomes a, a critical event. And literally, like, you have a hardware failure. And, and my, my, my conceptual of this is, in my, in my head, is always like, you know, 40 ninjas descending from the ceiling to fix the problem right now. Got to fix that problem. You know, it's, a, it's a hard drive failure. Got to replace that hard drive. If you build your software to be isolated from this, it, it, you know, now my, my joke is it's a you know, replace the, replace the bad hardware on Thursdays. I don't care which Thursday, just some Thursday, you go through and, and yank hardware, put new hardware back in. And, and that's where you want to be, because then, again, that goes back to 
to one is you don't treat these types of failures that will happen as a as a big um, you must must fix that one little point of failure right now. It becomes something that your applications just absorb, and that reduces uh, costs on a couple different layers. So so that's how we we got to all here, and and I I can I don't know how much time we have left. So I left some time for for questions. Um, I can answer about our our technology or anything else you guys um, have questions or I can I can keep talking until you fall asleep. So I'm I'm curious, I've heard a number of companies here today and other other countries and that they're focusing on downsizing the number of data centers that they're maintaining. It sounds like Verizon is still in the I'm wondering why that is. Uh, we're not actually going in the opposite direction, it's just that we have we have a lot of existing centers, and, and some of it exists for different reasons, and some are different sizes, so it depends on the part of the business. Some exist because of the, the, some of the communication latencies that need to be um, adhered to. Um, so me, for some of the stuff we're deploying with these applications, I actually would prefer fewer data centers that are larger in size. And so, so you know, by next year, I'm, you know, we'll have four up running our, our clusters that are spread around at least the, the U.S. and they're in different locations in the U.S., which for the applications foreseeable for my needs, um, I can meet any of the latency issues that I have. And, and my, my reason for that is, is every physical data center comes with a, a cost of operations, and so I can avoid that. But I think, um, and I think the cluster works better as a, as if I have a lot of uh, nodes and it gives more flexibility on how you schedule, it, it's a lot more flexible on what I call your fault zones. You know, it's like I, I can take a rack out. If I have lots of racks, I can take one rack out. It's not a problem. I can bring it down and, and do maintenance. If I only have four racks, it's a problem. So, so the bigger the, the cluster is, the cluster gets big and, and our racks are getting pretty dense. So, so if I don't have a lot of racks and I bring a rack down, I'm, I'm taking away a lot of compute and storage potentially. So we are trying to, to balance that, but we have a lot of existing um, data centers. We don't have a lot of, a lot, we, we have less of big ones. We have, we have some strategic smaller ones around. <coughs> Any other questions? It, right now, for the stuff we're looking at, it's as low as it as low as it can. I, I've looked at for the applications we're running. I could I could push traffic between our data centers. Um, we have an advantage. We we have this nice thing. We own our backbone. So <laughs> so you know the the times it takes to to push some information from one data center to the other um, is is not an issue for us. At least for the things we're looking at. And even to manage some of the, yeah, we're looking at some of the traditional uh, communication components in some of, in some of our networks, and and for where we would need to push a packet across to another data center, the latency was fine. And then within a data center, the way we've architected our our networking is the to go from one physical node to another node in the data center is a is a fixed set of um, routers in a sense. So the 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 round trip time or the to get it over there isn't is negligible. Yeah, yeah. Also working for a large corporation, I understand it looks like you also have a uh, single vendor strategy that you end up buying from every single vendor. How do you view uh, trying to balance the exploration in this area versus some of your traditional like Linux distribution <coughs> providers? How do you think this will affect? Uh, so we tend to we we actually tend to we actually tend to have a multi-vendor strategy. Um, it's it's usually not normal to and it depends on what you're what you're doing. So if you look at all of our e equipment vendors, is we we always tend to have a, a dual vendor strategy for for probably different obvious reasons. Um, as far as choosing so the components, so when I set out on this one, I did have to. There's some work internally 
to choose some of these components. There was a lot of work internally to, to set up. I mean, the, the whole notion of the containers and how you build this was, you know, people had to wrap their heads around that one. And some of the big ones are our, our, our operations teams and our security teams. So the security teams were really, um, and they're, they're pretty good. They, they, you know, they worked with us on a, a couple different things. And there's, there's definitely improvements that need to be done in the security area. You know, some of it was talked about today that would go a long way. But, so they work with you, but, but we, had to, we had to really like, pull them. Uh, choosing a different Linux distribution was a, was a challenge. That wasn't too bad. I had pretty good support from my management. And I made the case for why I chose CoreOS. And uh, you know, that, you know, that worked out OK. But there was a lot of, there's just a knee jerk reaction to push back. And then you just have to go, you have to go through that. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about how you're using Fleet and uh, Mesos, right? Sure. Since they both, you know, have scheduling aspects to them, like kind of how you're dividing the duties between those two. Yeah, yep. Well, Fleet's really, so we use Fleet. If, if I look at Mesos as sort of a middleware, and to run my applications, and, and they're, they're quite frankly, I do want to push a lot of services into that layer. But as we boot up the system, your know, fleet is used to configure everything on the core underlying system and to launch certain processes or certain things that need to be up and running. Like a lot of our storage solution needs to be up and running. And we actually use fleet to deploy the, some of the storage components that, that we have um, in our system. And then we use fleet to actually deploy Mesos. And so that's how we, we, we bootstrap the system. And I think I mentioned, yeah, we do Pixie Boot. We use the, the CoreOS update system. So that's pretty cool. We've, we've, we've rolled through the, our thousand nodes system, like rolling the CoreOS upgrade. That's always pretty cool, too, actually. And it works. We, we had an interesting issue with uh, early on where we, we had a, a lab set up, and we had like seven computers running CoreOS. And, and uh, these were inside the network, but Two of them got access. Two of them, you know, went out to the internet and hit the CoreOS update server and updated themselves and changed Docker versions. And then all of a sudden, we had like these commands going to these different machines, and and um, you know, obviously we'd get a failure because the Docker demons were different. You know, Docker they they change like every week, incompatible, and so it drives us crazy. We're like, what what's going on here? But, uh, but then we sat and we figured out what happened. We're like, oh, wow, it updated itself. We're like, well, that's cool. It worked. <laughs> Too bad it didn't update all of them. But, but, uh, but that, that was pretty fun. And it, it's good to, right now, we, we control that, obviously, in our production data centers. And, our, and we, we have two lab uh, data centers, too, that we're trying to push all of our. That's another thing. We're, we push all of our development teams to, to um, use our, our lab cluster and we just keep expanding the lab cluster. And that, that's pretty good, too, because in, in the past, every development team would buy its own hardware and manage its own hardware. And that was like, like crazy. So one benefit is you centralize that. The other benefit is you get every, all the app teams actually co-mingling, because that's how it's supposed to work in production. So you, you better get them co-mingling early. And that, that's dro driven some of them a little crazy. Yeah. Yeah, we are we are using containers in production. Um, so we, we launched we launched that cluster um, with some of um, some, an application that's actually servicing our our Verizon wireless customers. And as far as NFV, there's um, I don't really have anything to say there. I can't really. There's there's teams that are that are working in that area that um, I wouldn't comment on. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you tie applications as well as uh, servers to SCD and like, maybe specific? Uh, yeah, so, so we, ended up, um, we ended up running a separate instance of etcd for our applications. And then, we, we let, then the apps actually load balance onto the etcd um, system. 
and that, that seemed to, to work. And the reason we, there's two reasons we split. One was to um, isolate the system components so, it doesn't, so that the apps don't disrupt the, the system components. And then at the time, it's, it was on, you know, when etcd2 came out, is we didn't upgrade the, the, all the system components at that time. And so that caused us to split. And then the applications use etcd. It just depends on the apps on, on how or why they use it. And people are still sort of getting a handle on that one. Excellent. Good. Well, get a round of applause. Thank <laughs> you.